is being conducted on July the 19th in the year 2007 here at the Niles Public Library in Niles, Illinois. Uh, my name is Neil O'Shea, and I'm interviewing uh, Mr. John Bugaisky, who was um, an Army veteran uh, who served uh, on the DMZ in Korea uh, after the ceasefire. Um, we're conducting this interview here in the uh, group study room, and um, we're very appreciative that Mr. Bugaisky has uh, come in to uh, give his testimony, and he's been very patient. He first expressed an interest in, in coming in over a year ago, and so we're glad to finally uh, be getting down to business as it were. So I'm going to turn the tape recorder and the mic in his direction, and we'll ask uh, a, a few questions um, that should help uh, to cover the important uh, testimony that he wants to provide us. So, so Mr. Bugaisky, um when did you enter the, uh, the armed forces? Uh, I entered the armed forces in 1955, September of 55. Were, were you living in Chicago at, at that time? Yeah. Yes, I, I lived in Chicago, and I took my first uh, eight weeks of basic training at uh, Fort Riley, Kansas. And uh, my second eight weeks of training in Fort Orr, California. Did, um, before you went into the service, were you, um, had you already completed high school or? Yes, I had, yeah, I've completed uh, my four years of high school, graduated. What high school did you attend? Uh, I went to uh, Washburn Tech, or Washburn Trade it was called at that time. Yeah. So you were born in um, 1934, mm -hmm. so you would have been, um, in your er early teens during World War II, I, I suppose. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And in uh, the, the early part of Korea, now it's Korean conflict, I was still still in high school. So I really, you know, didn't get to get into the full swing of it, uh, the battle. The battle was uh, ended in uh, 53. So you entered, the, let's see if I get the dates right here. So you entered the you entered the service when you were nineteen, was it? Yeah, 19? somewhere around nineteen or twenty. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, was that because you you wanted to contribute to the to the national defense? Or right. Well, or? Plus, I also knew I had a two year obligation that I had to fill, and uh, and I went and uh, listed for two years. So I first I enlisted for three years and. And when I got down to the induction center, they said, well, you know, there's, you want to go out as soon as possible? I said, yeah, let's, let's get the ball rolling. Because the, for some reason, the uh, draft board was getting things all screwed up. I tried to have, push my name up so I could get my obligation done, and uh, they kept on goofing it up, so I just went down and enlisted. <laughs> and was there a particular reason why you chose the uh, the Army as opposed to any other uh, branch of service? I was always uh, an Army man. An Army man. Were there, yeah. were there relatives in your family that were Army men? Oh yeah, I had an uncle who served in the Pacific in the Army. Mm -hmm. yeah, I was strictly an Army guy. So um, you mentioned the um, the basic training in those two camps you went to. Mm -hmm. what, what, how did you find basic training? Horrible? It, uh, well, I found it... Uh, interesting? What yeah, it was. interesting. Uh, and, you know, good thing you were young when you went through it. That's all I could say, because yeah. it was physically demanding. Yeah. Uh, but I got through it with no problem. Was Had you done a lot of uh, traveling in the United States before you went in the Army? Really? No, I have not. No. I've been, so Basically, was, you really, if it wasn't for the Army, I wouldn't have moved away from where I grew up. <laughs> yeah. So, that must have been interesting being in different yes, states was. and uh, meeting all kinds of different people, I suppose. Oh, yes, it was, sure. Uh, most of the guys, you know, didn't have problems. There were some guys that couldn't adjust to you know, being away from home and never been away from home, and a couple of them had a somehow got out on, on a uh, mental discharge, you know. But I'd say 99.5% people adjust to the new life. So when you were in, um, in 
in boot camp, um, were you thinking that you might be sent overseas? Uh, uh, I really didn't know. Uh, it was just, it was just one of those things. There's like, probably was like 400 uh, guys in our company, and out of 400, I think uh, only something like 35 were pulled out for Korea. And I don't know what, uh, what, how the army uh, just took the first 35 off the. Uh, the roster, or how they figured out who went where. where. Yeah. No one ever, ever knows what the Army's thinking. I mean, I had no training in uh, military uh, as far as, uh, like, uh, military police. So when I arrived there, that's, that's where they put me, in a regimental police uh, outfit. Was that in Korea? That was in Korea, when I arrived in Korea, yeah. So, and that was with the, uh, the 24th, 24th Division and 21st Regiment. And so you didn't, there was no indication in your in your training or anything that you would wind up as an MP? No. So if you're an MP, does that mean uh, you got to be sort of tough or you have to enforce uh, rules? Uh, you or? have to enforce the rules. You have to, uh, like our daily job was we would have a gate guard and we would, uh, you would have to have the password and all this stuff yeah. to get in. and. Uh, and then in our, that was like at night that, or no, I shouldn't say like at night. Uh, what I mean to say is that we had different duties, like uh, during the day we would have checkpoints that we go out to, and we would check civilian personnel uh, that are in the, the DMZ zone, and they had to have proper identification. We always had an interpreter with us. And, that was our daily job, or we would have roving patrols and yeah. just keep your eye out for certain things. So you did your six weeks um, in Fort... Pardon? You did your six weeks uh, training basic in... Eight, eight weeks. Eight, eight, eight weeks, weeks in the beginning and eight weeks, uh, two eight. eight-week training. Uh, and and then just after that, then you went overseas. Did you right. get to come home on, after that or anything? After no. That? Well, after the first eight weeks, we were uh, we were given a, I think a week's leave, and then I had my orders to uh, the ship uh, go to Fort Ord, California. So I, I think it was somewhere around Christmas. So I had the Christmas and the New Year's off at home, and then I left for. Fort Ord, California. Did your family notice any big changes in you for having been in the <laughs> army? Or you... Well, I'll tell you, the biggest change they've seen on me was physical because I was such a skinny guy and I was always on the go. I was like uh, 120 pounds, right? And uh, after my first eight weeks, uh, I gained 20 some pounds. Wow. You know, and I was like, <laughs> you know. They didn't recognize me when I come on. I mean, usually it uh, works in the reverse, mm -hmm. yes. you know. But because I was always on the go, and then when I went in the service and everything was routine and everything was, you know, you do this and you do this the same every day. You do this, you do this, and you do that, and you would eat regularly. And then uh, I think it was what we used to call uh, candy and pie and ice cream. We used to call it pogey bait, and all that stuff. That's what put the weight on me. It wasn't the army food; <laughs> it was the food we ate after. <laughs> so I gained some weight, and it didn't do you any harm. It didn't carried, do me yeah. one bit of harm. No. Yeah. So you get the, you learn that you're being, you're one of the thirty or so from this famous twenty fourth uh, infantry. infantry division, twenty mm -hmm. uh, first regiment. Now. Why is the 24th Infantry Division uh, famous? Or? Oh, they're famous for, uh, they have a motto that they are the Victory Division, they are the first to fight. Now they were, the, uh, the outfit originated in Hawaii. Uh, it never was in the United States. Uh, and when the, uh, the bombing in Pearl Harbor started, they were the first ones actually to, you know, fight. And in the Korean conflict, they were 
the closest, I guess, to vision in the area. So they were again the first ones to uh, the land in uh, Korea. And during the conflict of June 25th, 1950. So there they again, again are the first out to fight. So that's, uh, they, they took one a heck of a beating out there and lost a lot of guys being the first to fight and not, not having a proper, you know, you're not everything is up to snuff when you first land in an area where all the hostility is. And so they got their butt kicked pretty bit pretty bad out there. But they were still there when I got there. And, uh, so you get the news, you, you're shipping to, um, to Korea, yeah. and you did by boat or by plane? Or? Yeah, I, had, I got my orders uh, in Fort Ark, California, and I was shipped to Seattle. And then from Seattle, Washington, they shipped us, uh, we went out to uh, Adak, Alaska, and we stopped there for a day, and from there we went to Japan, and this is by boat? By boat. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there were lots of other uh, troops besides the 30. Oh, yeah, 30, yeah. yeah. Although it was loaded, they had probably had three, four thousand, if not more troops. It was a Navy there. boat or a transport? Yeah, it was. In fact, it was. I, I don't know if I had a. On that picture that you took uh, with the metal, mm -hmm. that boat is called the USS Freeman. That's the one I went across. USS and, Freeman. Yeah. yeah. So it so was a Navy uh, ship. Lands in Japan. Yeah, we yeah we uh, we got to uh, Japan in. Uh, was, uh, I'm trying to think of the harbor. It wasn't uh, Tokyo. It was uh, Yokohama. Yokohama. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yokohama. And we stayed there a couple of days, and then they shipped us from there to uh, Incheon. And from Incheon, I was assigned my. Uh, my regular, my regular job, which was uh, with the uh, 24th Division in the 21st Infantry Regiment Headquarters and Headquarters, which means that's the regimental headquarters of the of the division. There was there were like three divisions in the uh, 24th. Uh, there's three regiments in the 24th Division. It was 34th. Regiment, the 19th Regiment, and the 21st Regiment. And the 19th and the 34th Regiment would rotate off the line, off the 38th parallel, you know. So when one regiment went in and they stayed, I don't remember if it was six months, six month crack, and then they would pull back and the 34th would go up on the line. And uh, they would rotate back and forth every six months. And the 21st Regiment, which I was in, we were called a backup regiment. In case there was a breakthrough on those two regiments, we would be the third uh, supporting regiment. So, so I believe it was somewhere, anywhere three to five miles off the 38th parallel. Yeah. So when you're in, uh, this is probably not going to sound very informed, when you're at the second camp in Camp Fort War training. Mm -hmm. You don't you don't know yet what division or regiment you're going no. to. Mm -mm. No. Then you then you assign we were to Korea and you Right. All I was told in uh, in Fort Ar, California after my eight weeks of basic there, my second eight weeks of training, I was considered to be light weapons that are being shipped to Korea. I'd be shipped uh, from uh, Fort Lewis, Washington to uh, Korea. And did you think that was a good assignment, or that's just the way it is, or? Uh, I really didn't have any thoughts about it, you know, yeah. it didn't bother me. <laughs> um, and so, then you're, so you're going to be assigned to military police. Mm -hmm. How did you feel about that? Like well, that I, it didn't bother me either. <laughs> I figure, you know, I, uh, you know, I think maybe uh, I always like fit and polish, and that's what that outfit is. Uh, military police is very fit and polished. I mean, you had to be sharp. You had to be, you know, it's, it's sort of an elite outfit. I look at it that yeah. way, you know. And, and to this day, I'm still the same way. My wife 
I was telling me, yeah, I'm going to sign you back up <laughs> because I still fit and polish today. I'm on the VFW uh, color guard, and we're a fit and polish outfit, you know. So um, you were assigned to the regimental headquarters as military police, mm -hmm. and then do you move? Do you have to move up then with the regiment when it when it, you're on backup? Or we are backup, but we have our maneuvers that we went through, and you know, this is what we have to do. And see, for instance, uh, our job during a uh, maneuver, as a, like a, a military strike operation, we, our job would be to uh, guard the CP, the Central the Command. Man oh, the I see. see. And that's what we would do. I mean, that's where all, all the big brass are in there making all the decisions. What what they're going to do and so how they're going to act. Making, and that, that's our, our job. So you'd be security. You'd be using more than just a pistol then, or, or oh yeah, or yeah. oh yeah, right, right. Rifles or rifles or 50 millimeter machine guns. Or, you know, our 45s we have. Like I say, I was trained in light weapons, so I could fire mortars and 75 recalls, 105 recalls. Our those were used to be on the jeep. You know, big round ones, that type of thing. So, and then there are regular infantry men that just fire the M1 or, you know. But light weapons are, uh, you know, usually assigned mortars and uh, 8.1 mortar and all this kind of stuff. It's a little a little more firepower than just a rifleman. You know. so, so you were up near the DMZ for the the militarized zone for right. for how long then? For the whole my whole my whole tour, I was up there. It was I don't know what it was, a year and something, a year and nine months, or a year whatever. One year, nine months, nineteen days. You were on the DMZ. Yep. Yeah. And was it was there a lot of? Um, you were there um, two years six. after the two three right. years after the ceasefire. Was there still a lot of tension and and danger? Or a sense of danger? Or I would who say, knows? or maybe not as much danger as, <laughs> you know, in 50, 50 when it started, you know. Uh, the dangers of, I mean, r routinely you would hear people getting uh, blown up by mine, minefields, you know. And a lot of times would be on what we call a roving patrol, where two guys just drive around in a Jeep. And uh, we'll see uh, Papa San out in the field. You see a big, big pile of dust go up in the air. You know, he just ran over a mine. Uh, and Papa San means? Papa San, he means an old farmer, Korean uh, farmer. We call him Papa San. And he'd be the guy that we get going. He'd be up. plowing his field, and he'll he hit a, line, a mine field. Or sometimes we've had, we had uh, fatalities where, uh, you know, we had certain times of the year they had these heavy rains and these these the minefields would wash off onto the road and uh, um, you would go down that road if you hit that mine you, there you go you know so did you did your, that did your uh, regiment uh, your unit did you lose any guys while you were there or I uh, lost uh, a handful of men uh, we have what they call every six months you were eligible to go on uh, R and R, it's called rest and recuperation leave. And what they would do is take you down to Tampa Bay Air Base, and they'd fly you over to Tokyo. And a C-124, big globe master thing, and held a lot of troops. You know. And uh, one of them went down mm. while I was there, and it went into the Yellow Sea. So it was going over. The 38 parallel when it went down, so it went down. Who knows how? If they shot at it or what? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I lost a handful of buddies on that one. So did you go make a similar flight then while you were oh, there? Oh yeah, you, yeah. you had your R&R in Tokyo. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, twice I think. I uh, went on R&R &R leave up there. Now, they were big airplanes, and you would think they're never going to get off the ground when they take off. They're just like four stories high. I mean, they were really huge. 
It would drive trucks in it and troops in it, and everything would be piled into it. You yeah. know, big, heavy airplane. Did you have much contact with the um, Korean people when you were there, or uh, the civilian people? Yes. Oh yeah. Uh, being in the job that I have, yeah, I, I was constantly in contact with them. If either at a checkpoint, you know, we'd have so many checkpoints in the area where we'd have to check their identification. And the only one we were allowed up on the 38th, up on the DMZ were uh, farmers. Of course, you know, they got a way of getting their identification changed so that, you know, uh, women used to follow the camps around. And, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, I can guess maybe. And uh, wherever camp moved, that's little village would pop up. <laughs> and uh, that was another one of my jobs. We had, we had to go, we would, see no, no military personnel is supposed to go off the DMZ. So if you go off the road, you're, you're not, it's cart mar martial offense. You're not supposed to be in villages, you're not supposed to be anywhere but in an army base or on the DMZ. You know, but anything off of it, you can be arrested. We used to have nightly raids where we would go into the villages to make sure that there's no military personnel. People are there are there, you know, with proper identification. If they're not, we load them into the trucks, send them back to Seoul. Did you ever have to load anybody onto a truck? Funny enough. <laughs> really? Oh yeah. Soldiers? Oh. Soldiers. You couldn't give anybody a break. It all depends how the order came down from the regimental headquarters. If it if it said pick up all military personnel off the MSR, and we would pick up. And all the MSR stands the, for uh, MS. Uh, gee, I forgot what it said. But off the road. In other words, you're off the DMZ. Then you're not. You're you're the, the DMZ. You're not on, on military ground. You're not supposed to be there. You're supposed to be either here or in your camp or... And the American half of the DMZ below the demarcation line is about, did you say three to five miles wide or something? Or how wide is it? Or oh. Is it a big area? Uh, it's, hard, it's hard to describe how... You mean how wide it was? Yeah. Because oh. your whole camp would have been in the DMZ? Yeah. Oh, then it, in right. So, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's a pretty big area. Uh, and like I say, the guys go out there and they want to have a good time and they want to have a couple of beers and stuff. And, and sometimes the orders would read to pick up all non-military personnel in the area, you know, without proper identification. And sometimes the orders would say, pick up all military personnel. <laughs> so one time we'd leave them alone and we'd pick up our guys. The next time we'd leave our guys alone and pick them up. And we'd send them to Seoul, and they were supposed to be women were supposed to be checked out, and yeah. And before you know, the next day they're right back. Right. <laughs> did but, any of your uh, Did you ever have to bring the heavy hand of the law down on some of your friends? Yes. Yeah. Oh dear. Yeah. That yeah. was hard, I bet. Yeah, that's not easy. Yeah, it's, it's that's that's why they said you know when we when we went over there uh, on the boat they sort of kept us shunned to the side for some reason, you know, mm -hmm. we could never figure that out, why Why just certain people, you couldn't mingle along with everybody, you just were sort of like pushed to the side. They didn't want you to get too involved with, you know, of course nice you had to get involved with your own company of, of, of people, but they knew everything that was happening. But see, a regimental headquarters is like a center point for all these different battalions, there's so many different battalions in in a, in, in a regiment, and there's so many so many different companies in a battalion. It just it forms out, spreads out like that. So it goes from regiment, it goes from division. There's so many divisions in a, in, in a, there's so many regiments in a division, and there's so many battalions in, in in a regiment, and there's so many companies in a battalion. And then it broke down to the platoons, you know, <laughs> to the individual. Organization, hierarchy, yeah. 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 So, um, is there anything that particularly stands out from your, your, your time in uh, serving there? Uh, 
Hmm. Most memorable event or funniest event or saddest event or? Mm, not really. I mean, they used to tell us that, uh, you know, 20 years from now, you look, you'll, you'll look upon this uh, operation as, uh, you know, a joyful time. You know? <laughs> and, and I actually do. I, you know, I, I remember all the friends I had out there and, you know, uh, people serve in the Navy and, and, and have served on a particular ship and, and they only have X amount of people on the ship, you know, I mean, it's only, you know, maybe even if it's a thousand, I know a lot of guys didn't know all thousand guys on their ship, but it's a little easier to locate people that were on a Pacific ship than it is to locate someone who's served in a uh, division where there might be 50,000 guys. You know, yeah. I you know, find one guy or one or two buddies out of that mass of people. We're in a ship. Oh, I was on that ship. I remember that guy and I remember that guy, you know. It's a little harder, you know. So were you, were you, you were still glad though to leave when, or to go back to the States when your oh. time was up? Did you oh, cons you didn't everybody's consider happy to come back home. You, you, you didn't consider <laughs> It's not like the United States. <laughs> you didn't consider re-upping, as they say, or making a career of the Army? No, but we do have, we do, we do have guys that, uh, when, what they call, uh, when you served your time, your drop comes down and, uh, that means you're you're going back home, at you know, after you serve your uh, your tour, and uh, we had guys that we uh, we had to go drag out of these villages that didn't want to didn't even want to come home, you know, and we also had guys that, uh, uh, sadly enough, they went from say a master sergeant to a slick slave, meaning that they got busted down stripe by stripe because uh, they were doing something illegally or refused the direct order or stuff like that instead of, you know, just court mouse and they would take one stripe away. So if you have three up and three down and all of a sudden you don't have nothing, you know, so it's sort of a disgrace. I mean, they end up, you end up in the Fort Leonard work, which is a prison, army prison here in the United States. Uh, and I had to uh, um, for, uh, the, you know, um, uh, misfortune to uh, have to uh, guard people like that during that. That that was a little on the sad side. You have to uh, walk around with a shotgun on a guy, you know, who's going to be. This was this, in He's going to be dishonorably discharged and sent to Fort Leonard. With, this was you know, in, in Korea. Korea. Yeah. yeah, that's sort of sad. But. That their life they chose. And yeah. But I wouldn't, that wasn't the average guy. I mean, yeah. But that would be the most so, memorable. So you, um, like like most people, you were glad when your time was up and you came back to the good well, old first, USA. So did you fly, how did you, where was your, get discharged? Well, you know, there's or? always rumors, oh, you're going to fly home, or you're going to go this, you're going to, I went home on a boat just like I left, but we did. Uh, a lot of guys, uh, when they got to uh, Fort Lewis on the way back, they'd had take, they'd send them by train to wherever they're, you know, like our area here was Fort Sheridan. Uh, but uh, fortunately enough, we got to fly home. We they flew us in from uh, uh, Seattle to uh, O'Hare, so that's sort of lucky. And then when you landed at O'Hare, yeah, were you were you? A civilian then, or? Oh no! Uh, when you landed, when we landed in O'Hare, uh, we were sent to Fort uh, Sheridan, Illinois, where we were. Uh, we had to turn all in all our gear in, and then we got our uh, separation papers. And, uh, what you you still had certain obligations, uh, even though you served two years. I had a total of six year obligation with the military. So that was two years of active duty and two years of uh, active uh, reserve and two years of uh, standby reserve. So a total of six years. The, the four years that, fill, that followed your, your uh, being in uniform overseas for those two years, did you have to go to regular meetings or 
any kind of special training or you mean after after when you came oh, yeah. back after the after I was uh, discharged excuse me from Fort Church and I had two years of active duty to serve in a reserve unit. So, so I had a reserve unit. They or? had one up here on Kedzie and Bryn Mawr. It was like a Nike site at one yes. time. Well, that, that's where I served my two years uh, active reserve duty. And that's like a meeting once a month? or Yeah, you had to go there once a month. You had to go there uh, uh, two weeks out of the summer. You had to go to special training. I was in a... Now, here again, there's the Army for you. I, I'm coming off of there from uh, military police or, or regimental police. Uh, they shipped me into a tank outfit. So I'm supposed to be training people how to drive a tank. I never even yeah. got in a tank. <laughs> That's the Army for you. So you didn't have any problems uh, readjusting to civilian life or you didn't lose weight uh, or... Uh, the only problem I had was uh, when I uh, when I enlisted in the service, I was working for a, a small outfit that did uh, uh, remodeling, tile work, and bathroom, redoing, you know, remodeling homes and stuff. I, I sort of was a, a trainee in that, you know. So then when I enlisted and I served my time, I come back, I try to get my job back. The guy wouldn't give me my job back. So I said, well, you know, that don't work, you know. The man you hired when I was in the service, I got more seniority than he does because you, you don't lose your seniority when you go in the service. That stays in that. So I want my job back. And if you don't want to give it back to me, I hand it over to the Army, which I had to do. And the Army got it back for me. And then when they sent him a letter saying that he has to get the job back, I told him to stick it. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to prove to him that I could it get it back wrong, if I yeah. wanted it. You yeah. know, well, who wants to work for someone who doesn't? Right. Yeah. yeah. I think they're still having problems like this now oh, with this Iraq thing. Yeah. It's just terrible. Yeah. So, um, did you make any any good friendships in the service that were it was you, you were able to maintain when you came back? Or, uh, not really. Because really? you were an MP, so. Yeah. Maybe that kind of, maybe that kind it didn't have, well, I had my friends that I worked with, yeah. Yeah. but outside of that, they didn't really want you to be too uh, chummy with everybody anyway. Yeah. You know. So, did you join any veterans organizations when you yes, came? Yes, I did. I, I, I tried to get in, well, that hadn't been for after quite a while I was out of the military because, uh, and then when I did try to get in the VFW, uh, I wasn't qualified because uh, after 1953, uh, everything dropped out of uh, out of sight. No medals, no no ribbons, no rec uh, recognition that you even served in Korea. And even on your discharge, it doesn't even state. It says I'm here overseas returning, but it don't tell you where. And it don't give you any. Uh, Combat ribbons, they don't give you nothing. And uh, everything on my discharge read N.A. And so when I tried to get into the VFW, it says, well, you know, you didn't, how do we know you served in Korea? Your DD-214, which is your discharge, doesn't state you served in Korea. I says, well, I know it don't state it, but I did. Well, we can't take your word for it. I said, well, then I'll find somebody who can prove that I saved him. So, so I contacted uh, Senator Yates at the time, who was living at the time, who was a senator, and explained to him. Uh, uh, well, before I did that, I, I did write to St. Louis, and they, they, they gave me a thing stating that well, because of the fire in 1973 that we had in St. Louis, it yeah. destroyed 80% of the records. Mm -hmm. So, therefore, there's no way to reconstruct your records or to prove that you served in Korea. And that was, period, goodbye. And that's when I went to my senator, explained it to him, and uh, he stepped right up at the plate and uh, got back to uh, St. Louis. 
And uh, lo and behold, they searched uh, in Washington for backup records and uh, found a morning report with my name on it when I was there in 1957, June of something, something, something. Sent me a copy of it, sent the senator a copy of it to put on their verification that I served in Korea, Tangu, Korea from 1956 to 1957. And uh, they sent me a photocopy of it. It wasn't the perfect, I've got all that stuff home. It wasn't perfect, but it was good enough. And they'd seen that, and they'd seen the letter from the director of St. Louis uh, sent to uh, me and Senator Yates. Oh, no problem, we have it here, you know. But then it took me years to get that all straightened out. You know, and uh, the VFW uh, changed their their uh, charters to read to accept uh, all veterans that served in Korea from 1950 to present time, and uh, because they needed the membership, they had to do something to correct this. So, uh, what their tie-in is with uh, Congress, I could never figure that, that out. And I, I always thought the Veterans of Foreign War was like a private club. You know, I didn't know what you know what ties that it has with the government, but evidently it has tie tie-ins with with Congress. It has to be approved by Congress. It has to be approved by the president. So, how to tie up is I don't, I don't know, but but they got it done and they got they got this approval and. Uh, that was in 1995, so I got finally got accepted into the VFW, and uh, and in 2004 it took another, you know, nine years for the government to. Well, the VFW must have said, well, our charters read that you must have a campaign medal in order to qualify for eligibility, and there's no campaign medal, so they had to come up with a campaign medal, and they finally did in 2004. They came up with the Korean uh, Defense Medal. That's for everybody who served after 19, from 1954 to present time, got that, got that medal. So, but then again, you had to put in for it. They just didn't send it to you. you know. um, but then it also said on there that they would correct your your VD-214 to read the the corrections, you know, the proper corrections. That, and I had to send it to an Army Review Board, and it took a year for them to decide. And they said, well, Mr. Bergaisky, uh, you only had two years to uh, correct any mistakes on your VD-214. <laughs> And at two years a long time, but to be served justice, you know, to be the right guy, we're gonna uh, we're going to uh, put that on your DD two fourteen, and because they failed to put your good conduct medal on there, we'll put that on there, and uh, we'll correct it, and uh, because of what happened in two thousand four, that it's not your fault that you couldn't put it on back then because you didn't have it, you know. So they they decided to correct it. I waited another year for them to give me this here, and I had to get back in contact with uh, Senator Durbin's aide to see if they he could light a little fire under their little butt. <laughs> they get the information, and here it is. Lo and behold, you got, the, you got the correction. Too. So you know who's got the weight around here. Yeah. The senators have to wait. God bless them. You got to be patient dealing with the army. I yes, guess. yes. Well, most guys, I, I think, you know, a lot of people would never go through this. And uh, I'm an officer out there at VFW Park Ridge here on 3579 Post. And uh, my uh, brother-in-law, who's the commander out there, he says, don't. When we get these new guys in, don't discourage them by saying, you had, it took you years to do this, and it took you years to do that. <laughs> don't tell them that kind of stuff. <laughs> so you were mentioning that you thought the, the, the VFW ought to change their name, did you? Yeah, I, I, I really think, you know, uh, that would be the, 
I see the handwriting on the wall. I mean, we're losing so many people. Uh, and the guys that we have are in their 80s from the Second World War. And even Korean guys are, getting, you know, I'm no youngster either, you know. And, uh, and it's hard to get people to run for offices. And you've got to have your offices to be chartered or otherwise the whole coast falls apart. Now, Park Ridge has always been the, it has been, the, or we, I think we still are. But it's always been the largest post in the country. At one point in time, there were 3,000 members. That's pretty huge for a post. Not active, but... What's the membership now? The membership now is down to 1,500. 1,500. And, and the office that you hold is... Uh, I'm a junior vice commander. Junior office. vice commander. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've been trying uh, so hard to try to figure out a way to uh, get the Iraq people coming back. Uh, involved with the VFW to stay strong because they're constantly trying to cut the VA budgets and uh, if we don't stay in numbers they're going to just take it all away from us and uh, we, I, we can't we can't we just can't get a handle on how to attract these uh, young men from coming back uh, my my thing was that I harped for a long time is that we have we could be attracting these people from Korea. A lot of these guys like me, I I knew I wasn't eligible, so I didn't bother with the VFW. Now a lot of these same people and a lot of the young people because are eligible but they don't know it. The simple reason is uh, after 1954, every year for the last 50 years up to this present date, every year, 50,000 troops have served in Korea, have served and been discharged. Now, that's a lot of membership that have been accepted into the VFW now, and which was not. As of 1995, you couldn't get in. But after 1995, they've been accepted. And I say target them people because there's 50,000 for the last 50 years, it's a lot of members, you know, and can't get it done. I don't know. How are we supposed to reach these people? You know, I don't know. But it's a really uphill battle now. The VFW is facing a real, real crisis as far as membership. And, uh, Do you think your, your military service uh, or experiences affected your view of life? Or the world, or well, that? yeah, I think it had. I think it affected me. I think it made me a better person. Uh, and I thought, and I still think to this day. And I don't remember what president took the uh, draft away. I don't remember if it was Nixon or or who it was. But I think it was the worst thing they've done for a young person. I, I can only speak about the male population. I don't. I'm sure there's a lot, a lot of women nowadays, like military too. Uh, but I think it, uh, I think everybody in this country, that's a citizen of this country, deserves to serve their country two years out of their life. It's not, nothing to ask for. It was an honor for me to serve this country, you know, and I wouldn't have it no other way. And I think people, I think young kids today should be, uh, obligated to serve their country for two years. I don't think that's too much to add. And if the ball falls wherever it falls, I mean, if it's, if there's a, a war going on, so be it. You know, I'm pretty fortunate that in the Second World War, I was too young. In the Korean conflict, I was too young and to actually get into the beginning of it. Uh, but young or not, I would have, I would have went, you know. I think that uh, taking away the draft was, was a bad thing to do. It makes a man out of you. It gives you a little backbone. And starts you off in life. I mean, on the right step, I think. Yeah, most of the veterans, uh, or all the veterans, I think, with the exception of maybe one. Um, and he was already in a professional career, and he had pulled back into the to be a dentist in Korea. Oh, um, 
uh, all the veterans, they, they agree with you, I think, are, that, are, that, mm -hmm. that, that the national service is, is valuable to the person and to the country. Oh, yes, I think so. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. That's a lot for your character, I think. And I think uh, also that, uh, I think if it wasn't for this Iraq thing, uh, I don't think the patriotism would show through in this country. I mean, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to label all the young people, you know, but most of them are not very patriotic, you know. And uh, but I, there's no end to my uh, feelings for these guys that are out there now getting all shot up out there and. Who knows if it's, you know, you don't know who to believe no more. You know, is there really a terrorist thing going on or or what is this going on, you know? I don't know. I support the troops. We send, uh, I'm on a committee where we pack ba uh, boxes of food and all kinds of stuff for the uh, troops in Iraq, uh, the post, uh, Pays for the postage, and I think we've sent this year 174 packages. Of, the, the Park Ridge VFW? Of, yes, mm -hmm. Park Ridge uh, VFW. And that's uh, 30, 3579. 3579. Uh, so we're very, very much involved. We support the troops 100%. I, I can't say that I support the previous government's uh, politicians uh, that are are supporting this war. I, I don't think we should be there, but yeah. but you can't forget our troops. You gotta support them. They're, they're something else. Yeah. Thank you for bringing in the the photographs, which we've scanned, and okay. we'll add that to the interview, and then we'll probably discuss the captions with you when we have your scanned your D two fourteen and the two fifteen corrected. Okay. Very um, good. At this point, is there anything you'd like to add that we haven't covered in the interview? Mm, no, I think we've covered quite a bit. We do a fair job? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Well, thank you, Mr. Bugaisky, yeah. uh, for coming in. I, I look forward to getting this, uh, this typed up for you so we can, we can review right. it. Thank you thank for you. having me. Mr. Bugaisky, I, um, I see your, um, your dear wife is waiting for you outside the door. Um, but. Why you said you're still spit and polish? What does all that mean? Spit and polish means you know you have the brass and you have your insignias, you have your belt buckles, you have your shoes. Uh, when I uh, this I was this is all I learned in my career getting involved with the military police out there. Everything had to be sharp. You had to have our uniforms had. Creases built right into them. Uh, our, we work maybe all day at shining shoes. I mean, you could shave in them shoes. You, instead of using a mirror, you could use, and we spit and polish. Just use a little spit and polish and polish and buff and buff and buff and buff till that thing shine like you've never seen it before. And the brass, the brass, you, you could shave in it. I mean, everything was sharp and uh, Guys used to take these, uh, how do you call them, coffee containers, a little gallon container, you put the coffee in and they'd cut the top and the bottom off and they'd put them inside their, the bottom of their uh, trousers so that they would round off perfectly. I mean, <laughs> everything was, that's what you call spit and polish. And that's, that's what we were. The, everything had to be just right, and you had to know how to perform with the right. In fact, just the other day, we had a practice uh, at the post, uh, 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 color guard guys, and I was showing them some routines that we did with flipping the weapons and doing different positions of present arms. Instead of just coming up and doing it, we would flip it. And I show a couple of guys, we should add that to our, <laughs> our routine. Because you, you, you serve in the Post's uh, Honor Guard. Yes, guy. yes. Mm -hmm. And then when you were out recently uh, at the Rosemont, you were mm -hmm. ho hoping to recruit new members. Members for the Post, yes. To the Post. And what did your sign say? 
All the saints there, attention veterans, keep the VFW strong, protect your VA rights. Join Park Ridge VFW Post 3579 today. And, uh, and lo and behold, we did. I got two guys that came up with the dues were $28 a year. And uh, they came up with cash, and, and one guy was transferring from uh, a, uh, a suburb into Park Ridge. So that's actually three memberships. And we had three, uh, three said they'd be there Monday to uh, sign up. So there's six, six guys. So it was, uh, yeah. was better than nothing. <laughs> and the uh, people were so happy to see us. That's what I really, really uh, couldn't get over it, you know. And you say you're still spit and polished to this, to to this, this day, day yes. because of your Army experience. And then your wife comments on it too, right? Yes, my wife says, well, I'm going to sign you up in the service. <laughs> <laughs> I said, they wouldn't want no old foggy like me. But, but I still, to this day, want to look sharp. I mean, our uniforms are sharp. Uh, everything's got to be right. Our brass has to be just, just so. Everything is... Uh, when you're in a uh, elite outfit, like a color guard or like a uh, uh, honor guard or any of that kind of stuff, everything has to be by the numbers. Even when you're using the weapon, you just don't put the weapon out and count three positions in your weapon. One, two, three, four. That's right shoulder arms. There's four counts in putting that gun to your shoulder. So everything has to be done in sequence and with each other. So that's what we try to do all the time. We try to get sharper and sharper as we go along. The sharper the outfit looks, the better you look. You know. And the people eat it up. Like I said, we were at Rosemont, they seen us in our uniforms and all this stuff. The people were coming up, oh man, and I was in this outfit and I was in that one. Oh, congrats, thank you for doing what you did. You know, and it was very nice. And, but I got to look for a way to bring in some new membership. That's the main thing. And, uh, a lot of young guys, they see us and we have a, sort of a bad image at the VFW that uh, all these old guys, all they want to do is sit around and drink beer and talk about their old war, wartime stories, you know. But you know what? We've got about three or four Iraq guys in, and what we did, I said, you know, we have to get in, we have to sort of take them in our arms and bring them, and don't let them sit in that corner, and there'll be a one meeting and never come back. Bring them into the fall. First thing we asked them, you know what, you young guys, we need some more uh, color guards. We need some young blood in this color guard. So we right here we got them signed up in the color guard and fit them with their uniform. And now they seem to be, you know, they like to sit around and talk about military, and that's fine, you know. But we have to sort of bring them into the flow. We got we got to get rid of our old ways and start adjusting for the young people. I think that's the only way we can bring these people in. It is a hard road to try to get new membership. Mm. It really is. In fact, the guys are getting old now. They want to do this, they want to do that. They don't want to run for office. You know. And you have to you have to fill your chairs, otherwise the, the alpha will collapse. You know. now, uh, I, I hate to see an alpha collapse that has 1,500 members in it. Yeah, They're not active members. We might get 50, 60 at a meeting, which ain't too bad. That sounds great. But, uh, you know, how would you like to fall off if you had 1,500 members in it? They'd just disperse those membership all over the country, you know. As you say, it, it, um, as an advocacy group for veteran, veterans' rights, I think yes. that's yes. that sounds like a wonderful continuing oh, purpose. It is. Yeah. Yeah. We do a lot of nice things. We, we uh, go down to Heinz Hospital once a week and we play bingo with the guys in the final wards. And uh, we donate uh, a lot of money out to Heinz. And we do a lot of community things. We have what they call patronage pin. We uh, sponsor young people and uh, get them uh, money for college or you know, 
So we do a lot of good community things, you know. And we have our little parties. We have a party once a month out at the post and keep keep the costs down, try to keep, you know, keep the post alive. And, uh, we have corn boils and we have uh, all kind of dinner dances. And we, have, uh, we have a lot of fun. It's not as active as we used to be, but uh, it's a fairly good sized post. Mm -hmm. And always harping on membership and that's and it sort of drives me goofy because I can't figure out a way how to contact these people. Yeah. You know, I thought maybe one way, well, maybe the international should put a, a commercial mm -hmm. out on TV to try to attract some more kids, uh, young people. Or even radio or internet or something. Yeah, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we try, we try to, I try to put it in the neighborhood paper every so often. Uh, in Jefferson Park area or Portage Park, all through here, this area here. I don't know how many, I don't know what post, there's probably a post here, I'm sure, of in Nyack. Yes, there is, yeah, in Milwaukee yeah. Avenue there. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, I think maybe uh, all posts should try to get together and try to iron out some kind of way to. But I really think this here uh, Veterans of Foreign War should be changed to Veterans of Foreign Service. Probably half the guys would shoot me for saying it. Especially the old guys. Uh, the old guys don't like change. No, no, no yeah, yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm getting like old guys are too. <laughs> I'm getting like that too. But anyway, yeah. well, that's a, you, that's a very good statement you've given us uh, here okay. today. And, um, thank you very much. Okay, thank yeah. you. Right.